Okay, so um, here are again a number of aluminum alloys with their compositions. It doesn't go to the 1100s because they're basically nearly pure aluminum. So they have these aluminum copper alloys in the 2000 series which are fairly highly alloyed. This is, I don't remember, this is like 5% or so out here at the eutectic. So these are way out towards the eutectic on the, in most cases. Or if they have smaller amounts, they have larger amounts of something else. Uh, in this case, manganese or magnesium or whatever. Then you get to the, they've got uh, some of the 6000 series, these are, these must be the heat treatable, heat treatable wrought aluminum alloys. 6061 is the workhorse and it says structural alloy, automotive, railway, marine applications, pipe and pipe fittings, good formability, weldability, corrosion resistance and strength. And I told you that's probably the most commonly used aluminum alloy available as extrusions, sheet, plate, um, go to a supply center and it has everything. We have 7075 high strength aircraft and other applications, but we really don't weld the 7000 series most, most of the time, and I'll show you that in a little bit. Um, they like to rank, the aluminum companies rank the aluminum alloys in terms of their weldability. Um, so this is sort of an aluminum association uh, table. Most aluminum association tables came out of either Alcoa or Alcan, um, developed them. And here's your 2000 series, and A is good welding. Actually, show it to you down here. A is readily weldable. B is weldable in most applications. May require special technique or preliminary trials, which means it's not that weldable, folks. And C is limited weldability, which don't bother. Okay, um, I wouldn't say you couldn't do it, but you're going to have to have all kinds of problems. Um, so if you look at the 2000 series. The best any of them do, except 2219 or 2218 or something anyway, is like a arc welding with, with uh, an A, but everything else is B and C. If you go here at 6061, whether you're talking about oxyacetylene or arc with flux or arc with inert gas, it's good for everything. It's, it's got a B for pressure welding and B for soldering, but aluminum is extremely difficult to solder. Okay. As a rule, we could I'd probably go through that on the on the soldering part of the course that you get to watch by video. But anyway, that's why 6061. You won't find here's 6101, which is A's everywhere. But and here's a 60 uh, 6101, as I remember, is fairly lightly alloyed. 6951. Um, but 6061 is good strength and readily weldable. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about design of aluminum. And one of the problems you have is um, this happens to be an example of the strength variation. Let's close these things a little bit. Um, the strength variation, both within a lot and um, among many lots. So this high peak here is, what does it say, 180 specimens from a single sheet of aluminum. Uh, let me turn that off. Oh. I stopped it. Uh, so <coughs> this is a bunch of specimens taken from one sheet. has a fairly narrow distribution of heat treated properties. This is 4,300 4, samples from many sheets just coming out of the mill, and a wider distribution of properties. And it has a little A line here and a little B line here. This is in strength in megapascals. Uh, this is yield strength. And now this is 7075, so this is getting up towards 70 or 75 KSI yield strength. Um, not, re not necessarily readily weldable, but what does it mean, A and B? Anybody know what A and B in aluminum is? Um, it has to do with the the how tight your mechanical properties are going to be. And I will now tell you a secret if you like to have scientific data or engineering data on your computer. There is nothing cheaper than buying technical literature from the US government because they have to sell it at cost and if you download it the cost is zero. Okay, 
So Mill Han what used to be Mill Handbook 5 for about 40 years is a like 15 volume set of these things of the mechanical properties to be used for design of aircraft. Okay? So if I want to know about aluminum, this is one of the places to go. In fact, if you read about the introduction of this, um, the scope of the handbook, and it says, um, it used to be Mill Handbook 5, it's now called Metallic Materials Properties Development and Standardization, MMPDS 05, okay, but it used to be Mill Handbook 5 was prepared by Patel Memorial Institute under contract to the FAA, Federal Aviation Administration, and um, somewhere in here it basically says that if you're going to build an aircraft for the defense, for any part of the U.S. government, FAA, Defense Department, anybody else, you must use this handbook for your mechanical properties of your material. And you're, I'll show you a little bit. Um, where you design it. You can get the 15 volume set in hard copy like this for $105. You can download it for free. Just go to the internet and look up MMPDS05 and download it. And so you can have all 15 volumes. Now I told you how important steel is. Here's chapter 2 is steels. Okay, this is not too old. This is April 2010. <coughs> Chapters, chapter 3 comes in volume A, which is aluminum alloys, 2000 and 5000 series, and volume B, which is 6000 and 7000 series, <coughs> compare the thickness of steel versus the thickness of aluminum. Okay, Here's one case where there's a lot more data on aluminum than there's on steel. Why? Because this is aircraft. We don't build less steel aircraft. We do build some frames and there's landing gears and other things that go in here. Um, but there's a lot of good technical information in here, particularly if you're trying to go to sleep at night. Um, for example, if I want to look up, I mean there are tables after tables of, you know, stress intensity factors and, and uh, fatigue curves and things like that. And this is what you have to design things to. If I look at one of the tables in here, it will tell me that, here's my A and B, by the way. This is 7075 aluminum alloy extrusions. There's going to be a different table for aluminum alloy plate, and there's going to be a different one for aluminum alloy sheet. Okay? So they, you have slightly different properties depending on the form of the material. Here are the mechanical properties. Ultimate tensile strength, longitudinal, longitudinal transverse direction of the extrusion, okay? Um, so there's tensile strength and yield strength. I have A values and B values. B values are if you're just building some commercial airliner or some military jet. A are very tight values such as you're building a spacecraft, okay? And so if I went back to the thing I put up before and said, what's the difference between A and B values? Well, this particular book told you. I'm sorry, B has to be tighter spec than A. Um, so yeah, okay, that's right. B has got a tighter spec than A uh, because there's a lot more testing that goes on. You verify each sheet, not each alloy, okay? And you're going to have traceability if you're going into a spacecraft or something like that. And so B has tighter tolerances than A. Um, see if that's true. Um, B is going to give you uh, an, a strength level that you can consider your minimum, whereas you'll have a wider range for A. So A is going into co common aircraft uh, aerospace applications. B is going into very critical applications. They also give you the properties as a function of thickness of the material. Okay, and you can see it doesn't change a lot, but if you're trying to be really weight critical, particularly on a spacecraft or something, another one KSI, you know, one or two percent could make a difference. Okay, they're really designing th these things fairly tightly. But um, so that's the design standard for aircraft, and it has a lot of the material on aluminum. If I'm just building some sewage treatment plant out of aluminum, 
I'm going to use the structural welding code for aluminum, which is AWS D11. Steel code is D1. I mean, the steel code is D11, and the structural aluminum code is D12. And I think I showed you the stainless steel code yesterday. I had with me. I don't think I still have it with me, but it's 1.6. And there's there's structural welding codes for rotating machinery. There's structural welding codes for large ca steel castings. There's about 20 different structural welding codes. There's structural welding codes for reinforcing bar for concrete. Um, there's structural welding codes, I think, for cast iron now. Um, but anyway, they make money by coming up with more codes, um, as far as that goes. If, but if I look in here, um, the structural welding codes will give me design values. All the codes, structural welding codes, will have either, either chapter 1 or uh, either chapter two or three, depending on the code. So it says number one is always general requirements of the code, design of welded connections, and it will give you in qualification of the welders, and then you go on to uh, other things like inspection and welding and stuff. But design of welded connections, well, there's only three pages on design of welded connections. Why is that? So if we go to that, should show me. Um, here's the scope of design of welded connections. And it's going to tell me, somewhere in here, to go to, I'm not seeing it right now. Basically, without, I'm not finding it right now. But it's going to tell me to go to the aluminum design manual, which is a little thicker than three pages. Okay. This is going to tell me for aluminum, it's called out by the structural welding code. Maybe it was on, maybe it's on the introduction, chapter one. Um, anyway, it, it does call it out. Um, oh, here it is. It is in chapter two. It says, well shall be sized for strength requirement using the effective areas defined in section two and conform with the aluminum design manual and specifications for aluminum structures unless otherwise cost. So they, they shorten this code by calling out a standard written by the aluminum association. So this is Alcan, Alcoa, Pechene, Kaiser, Reynolds, all getting together in collusion to tell you how to weld aluminum. Uh, I could, we could go through here, but they're going to give you, in fatigue, guess what? You're going to see something very similar to these types of tables we saw in the steel welding code, where you have A, B, C, D, E, and F types of joints, and you're going to have these pictures of different bars and what the fatigue strength is uh, in different condi welded conditions almost identical, but not exactly identical, because you use slightly different connections in aluminum than you do in steel in many cases. It will give you all kinds of, um, uh, well, other design criteria. Um, the big thing in the steel business now is uh, what they call allowable stress design, okay, which is a, a different philosophy. The old time they just said this is your safety factor. Now after the Northridge earth earthquake in early 90s, like 91 or 92 in Los Angeles, the steel construction folks went back and said let's get the design out of the 1920s and bring it into the, the 1980s. And they did. And it's called the allowable stress design. And so you probably didn't catch it because I didn't emphasize it, but uh, I brought in the aluminum steel, uh, the steel construction manual. I said this used to be the Bible. Okay, it was before the allowable stress design Bible came out in the late 90s, and that was really as a result of a lot of the problems they had with buildings in the Northridge earthquake in Los Angeles. So the steel guys got together and said, "We need to do a more modern design that's not as." weak in some areas and too strong in other areas. And now it's the allowable stress design and I have no idea what they're talking about when I go look at it. Um, you have to be trained as a civil engineer. But they got, they got uh, sections on material properties, 
they'll have sections on weld properties. You'd be surprised, in aluminum, in steel, you usually can say the fatigue life or the, the allowable stress in steel uh, might be one-third. In fact, it is. It's, um, I take that back. For the base metal, the allowable stress for design is typically uh, 0.6 of the uh, ultimate tensile strength. Is that right? No, 0.6 of the yield strength. And the weld is 0.3. So they up the safety factor for the weld by a factor of two. Okay. So if I've got a, oh, no, the 0.3 is on ultimate tensile strength. So if I got a 60 KSI uh, uh, weld metal in steel, I can design it to 20 KSI. It's a factor of three or 3.3 or something. Um, if I look at the code. For the base metal, it's half of that. I can actually have the base metal stressed to 35 KSI or something like that. In any case, in aluminum, I might have 25 KSI, uh, but as a yield, not a, an ultimate, and I may only be allowed 7 KSI as my design strength because aluminum is less forgiving. Why is aluminum less forgiving? It's not as tough as steel. If I went back to that plot I showed you in the very beginning, as steel is the toughest material, has the greatest combination of strength and toughness and cost of any material, and that's why we use one and a half billion tons. Well, aluminum, we use 45 million tons a year, but aluminum doesn't have the same type of toughness. So aluminum is not as tolerant of large defects. I told you the critical flaw size for ripping a sheet of paper if it was in a steel, an HY100 steel, it'd be two feet in most cases. But in aluminum, it might be two inches. Okay? The toughest aluminum alloy, and it's ten times tougher than any other aluminum alloy, is one that was developed in the mid-twenties. And they use it for propellers, aluminum propellers. Aluminum propellers will bend 180 degrees before they'll break, okay? But we don't use that for aluminum structures because we need more strength. Aluminum, if you actually look at, it's actually 2020, 2025 alloy. If you look in here for 2025 alloy, there's all kinds of data on 2025 alloy in the, the old mill handbook for aluminum alloys, I could look up 2025. Its toughness is five to ten times greater than 2024, but its strength is probably about two-thirds as much. But it can bend like, like steel. But it's the only aluminum alloy that comes anywhere close to that. Because we're usually trying to push the aluminum just like baseball bats to higher and higher strength, which means more and more, more, and more corrosion problem, problems of stress corrosion cracking and other things. Um, because we're using aluminum because we need the performance of the lightweight uh, for whatever reason for our structure. And now the Navy has changed in the last 10 to 15 years where you like to emphasize, well you still build ships out of steel, but you sort of learned to do that over the years. But now you uh, are building your newer ships, <coughs> um, the littoral ships, out of aluminum because you have to have speed capability. In fact, when I first went to a littoral, first time I ever heard the word littoral was probably, I don't know, late 90s, early 2000. Went to a conference down this mountain resort in Virginia and uh, it was snowing, it was January as I remember. Um, and they, they were, I walked in a little late and they were talking about the littoral battlefield. I had to ask someone at the break, what's a littoral? I thought that was a latrine, no, no. Uh, they explained that it's close in uh, uh, near the coast. Um, and they were talking at the time of um, 50 knots minimum or something on the ships. Is that still kind of what they're trying to do on these? Yeah, I'm sure they had to drop it because whatever they were saying at that time, I thought, I mean, the only way you're going to do it was with hydrofoils, <laughs> okay? And you can't can't put everything on a hydrofoil. You you can't afford that much fuel, okay? Even the Navy can't, even the government can't afford that much fuel. Anyway, one of the things about aluminum alloys, which I've already alluded to, is you have to avoid mixing the alloys 
with the wrong thing. This comes out of the welding handbook, but it's on any book on welding aluminum. And uh, there's lots of notes on this table. This goes for two pages in the welding handbook. But what it is, is a table of how to select a welding filler metal. Okay. Um, if I'm going to weld, uh, what is this, 1060 aluminum, which is 99.4 aluminum, to a casting of aluminum 201, which is aluminum copper casting, I've got to use 4145. ER just means electrode. Okay. Uh, if I'm going to weld it to 356, a very common or 357, two very common aluminum castings used on motorcycles, all kinds of things. Um, you're going to use a 4043 filler metal. That's the workhorse filler metal. If I'm going to use 6061 and weld it to 5083, something that the Navy might, might do, um, a lot of other people too, but they're going to use a 5356 filler metal. If you're going to weld 6061 to itself, use a 4043. If you try to use some of these other welding electrodes and you don't follow this table, you're going to get cracking because you're going to be, you're liable to be not in this range or this range where you want to be lightly alloyed when you mix the weld metal with the base metal or highly alloyed you'll be in the wide freezing range and you're going to have cracking. So when people come to me, when I told you when people come to me and say I want to weld a piece of steel, I say give me the composition, give me the thickness and you know, I need to know hardness and hardenability of that steel. On aluminum I need to know composition so that I can pick a proper filler metal, okay? And I need to know composition on both sides if it's dissimilar alloys. And anyway, um, so if you're doing 50, 5083 to 5083, you should use a 5183 filler metal. 50, you, you're not going to buy 5183 plate. 5183 is an electrode, okay, alloy designed for 5083. And so they change it, make it 5183. It's not like steels where it tells you the carbon content and things. These are just thousand series alloys. And you have some new alloy and you apply to the Aluminum Association and get it. And I'll give you a little uh, case study on how to se select aluminum alloys in a little bit. Anybody have any questions? I want to talk about design of aluminum welds first. So if I was welding, uh, steel, this actually happens to be an example of welding two plates of different thickness and they show how you you would taper one down in aluminum because you can't steel has more toughness which means it can tolerate sharp corners a lot more than aluminum. It has lots of ductility. Aluminum doesn't have as much ductility. Okay. Uh, the, the director of research at US Steel, admittedly not the m most unbiased person when it comes to aluminum, this is John Gross who helped develop HY80s and, uh, back in the 50s and 60s when I was a young engineer I heard him say he called aluminum the near metal okay steel was the metal and aluminum was nearly a metal might have a little ductility but it wasn't quite and he wasn't anything close to steel according to John which there's some truth to that but it's also a little bit unfair um, because you might be welding heat treatable alloys but in some cases when you have the even in the non-heat treatable alloys, when you have the luxury, you don't necessarily just weld a, uh, a groove weld between two plates. You might put two cover plates on and put fillet welds on. Why? It's easier to make fillet welds than it is to make groove welds. It takes more skill for the welder. Um, Tom, were you the one saying you had to have qualified aluminum welders? Did you mention that? Okay. It's hard to f harder to find qualified aluminum welders. I was doing something for uh, MIT Lincoln Lab. They wanted to, the Air Force wanted to take the old MIT Millstone radon, not a radon, well it is a radon, uh, but M MIT has this, this little peak out here in Millis, Massachusetts, not Millis, can't remember what the town is, just north of Boston here. And they had built this, this radar antenna back in the 50s and it was for research p purposes for the MIT Physics Department and that type of physics went away or uh, got exhausted or whatever. So they had this big steel bearing that could hold this thing and they were trying to find some application for it and they decided they would sell the uh, Air Force on a three, I think it was a 300 gigahertz radar system, okay? And they were gonna, officially what they told me, they were gonna look for space junk. I mean, there's 
tens of thousands of things orbiting the Earth. A lot of it's just little shreds of, of things that, you know, when something blew up up there or whatever. And it's floating around, and if you're on a manned spacecraft or the International Space Station, and you run into the, one of these things, you could be running into it at 17,000 miles an hour, I guess, in some cases. And something the size of a pea could go right through, uh, you know, a one-inch thick piece of aluminum uh, like a laser beam, okay? So there are hazards to this. Plus, they'd like to know if some of that space junk is not really junk, but might have antennas on it or things like that. Uh, and so if they had higher frequencies, they could get better imaging from Earth. And so they wanted to build on top of the steel pedestal and, and bearing that was probably worth $100 million if you had to build it today. Had been built for physics research back in the 50s or whatever. They wanted to put this big aluminum structure, which was bas basically just a big radar dish. Only at 300 gigahertz, you start thinking of the, the wavelength of the frequency, and you're down to one or two millimeters or something as the wavelength of this 300 gigahertz. You know, most of your, what's the, the frequency of most of your radar is you know, 10 or 20 gigahertz. I mean, this is way up there in frequency compared to what you might, might be using with a phased array radar on a ship or something. Not that I'm an expert on radar frequencies, but anyway, this was a much higher frequency and therefore required a dish that was much, much more precise. This had to be sort of a spherical or nearly spherical piece of aluminum sheet metal and it was about, if I remember correctly, about 150 feet across and the tolerance was like an eighth of an inch end to end. Well, you can't even, first of all, it's inside a ray dome, and so the sun doesn't shine on it to get thermal expansion problems. But you now gotta start worrying about the temperature that this thing's at because it can distort. And it had all kinds of apt, active things. They do things for, for uh, uh, microscopes and optical telescopes now that will change the shape of things actively, active shape change. They do this on aircraft, uh, military aircraft. They change the shape of the wings in real time, about 10 times a second. Some computers changing the shape, shape of the wing uh, because of instabilities and stuff. So they wanted to build this thing and uh, so they went out for bid and no one would bid on it, okay? Because you had to do like, you had to build structures that would be across the size of this room and you had to have a tolerance without doing any active, be a half an inch side to side. So you're gonna build a, a truss structure from here to there, welded, and you're going to have to have that thing meet in X, Y, Z coordinates within a half an inch, plus or minus half an inch, or actually plus or minus a quarter of an inch, I think it was, a half an inch total in all three dimensions. So if you're fixed over here, you know, 50 feet away, that's not 50 feet, but it was like 50 feet away. It was just a tremendous tolerance. Um, and no one was willing to bid on it, so they called in a team of us to figure out what to do. And they did find a company. It was a guy who used to work at an electric boat and started a very fancy welding company. He was doing a lot of electric boat work. In fact, when we went through, they were, they were redoing some of the boomers have been turned into... Uh, yeah, SSG. yeah, so they, they don't have nuclear anymore. They basically take the tubes and they, they put a bunch of non-nuclear warheads in there or something, okay? So SSGNs or something. They were doing the retrofits for some of these boomers to take, this was all part of SALT, I guess, you know, getting, cutting down on the number of nuclear warheads, and, but they were putting like 19 of these tubes inside of one of the big old uh, uh, Poseidon, Poseidon, right? Was sure. tried, tried mission, tridents, trident tubes. So they were building the inserts for this. And there was a lot of precision to that. We went to this place, it was really a pretty incredible welding shop, one of the best ones I've ever seen. And they finally took the contract and they successfully built it. They did have some cracks, that I, so I got to go up to Millis and look at the cracks, but um, it wasn't, a, in my opinion, it wasn't a big deal. All the physicists were worried because they saw a crack. It's a big deal. We have cracks in everything. But they didn't understand that, just like the, the Air Force General I told you about. In any case, in aluminum, you like to have lots of fillet welds because you can find weld. Oh, this, the reason I got on that story. No, they couldn't find enough qualified aluminum welders in all of New England. 
to build the structure in the time frame they wanted. So they either had to train some new ones or they had to import them. Okay. When you're only making 45 million tons a year as opposed to one and a half billion tons a year, there's not as many people who can weld aluminum. And that's what you had mentioned. And sometimes you can't even find them in that region. Okay. That's also true in some types of welding of steel, for example, but it's more political in that case. All the pipeline welding in the world is done by a union out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Okay. And we still manually weld pipelines, you know, gas pipelines in the field, because if you try to weld them automated, you will never build that pipeline according to the union. It doesn't go in any written contract. It goes sort of like, it's sort of like a deal, you know, you watch The Godfather and the, they make a deal that they can't refuse. So the, the union in Tulsa will make sure everybody knows. They, they had the technology to do automated welding in 1976 on the Alaskan pipeline. Probably could have come up with better quality than manual welders. Built it manually. And they still do, 40 years later, because the Tulsa Union is a very powerful union. You will not build a pipeline anywhere in the world, unless you have to be the former Soviet Union where that union doesn't have as so much power, okay, or China or something. But in general, you go to a, a rock or somewhere and you want to build a pipeline, the Tulsa Union's got the job, okay. Just to tell you, you know, there's a little corruption in this country too. Um, so anyway, they have different designs. This is actually sort of a, a lousy design to put intermittent welds in. This double lap design, um, rather than a straight butt weld, you know, you'd like to have nice clean straight butt welds, and you do in steel, but in aluminum, a lot of times, you can do a straight butt weld in aluminum, but a lot of times we do other things. Here are some designs out of an aluminum design manual. Uh, one of them is you're going to make a, a U-shaped um, uh, joint, and you could do two fillet welds on the outside, or you could do four fillet welds or you could actually, since aluminum is relatively easily formed at low temperatures, you could basically just get a simple, simple lap joint and you don't put anything at the corners. We really like to avoid welds at the corners in aluminum. Steel has lots of toughness and so we don't mine corners in steel. We put the welds in the corners and usually do pretty well. But aluminum, you, you don't like to put welds at corners. They will tend to crack, uh, either crack or fatigue. Here's a, a little lap joint where they actually machine the edge of the aluminum. Aluminum is easy to machine, relatively easy to machine compared to steel. Uh, and you actually put two partial penetration welds in to make a lap joint. You can do this if it's not a fatigue loaded strict uh, situation. So it depends on the stress in your, in your application. It depends on what room you have available. Uh, here's, a, here's a design down here where they're making a T-joint. They actually use an extrusion and then they and to a plate and actually put a fillet weld here and a groove weld here to try to get rid of uh, some of the uh, corner, corner welds. Um, gets to be pretty extreme. Um, you're going to say, well, I've seen lots of aluminum structures that are welded just like steel structures. Yes, but I took about a two-thirds hit in my safety factor um, or my allowable stress in order to build it that way. If you really want to make aluminum and get the same type of stress level, uh, per percentage of yield stress that you get in steel, you've got to start worrying a lot about your, your design of your joints. This one's probably not that useful. Um, here's one that sort of a little bit shocking. Um, ordinarily, you take a, a butt joint, and in steel, you just make a pipe weld. In aluminum, you might put a sleeve over it, and you might even put a weld in here, but you don't trust that weld, particularly if it's a heat-treatable alloy and you can't get full joint efficiency, you put another sleeve around it and make a bunch of fillet welds. It doesn't take a lot of um, high qualification for a wel welder to be able to make that joint. Um, other types of improvements in aluminum joints that we don't usually worry about in steel so much. In steel, you might make a joint like this, or you might make a a full weld all the way around. In aluminum, you'll start to taper the edges. This structure that, oh, actually the other thing that they do, and they used a lot on this thing at uh, Millstone for Lincoln Lab, a lot of gussets. So you, in steel, you'd bring a, 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 a pipe into the side of a web of a 
steel flange and you just bevel the pipe and weld a circle around it, right? Not in aluminum, you weld on a gusset and then you'll put a little slit and you'll slip that over and you'll do a bunch of fillet welds. Um, so now you have lots of weld area for the gusset up against the web. You also have um, lots of uh, uh, fillet weld area, again a fillet weld. Very easy to weld um, and needed in aluminum where you, get, you need the extra strength of lots of weld metal. You'll taper down to get more, more area and you'll, you don't want to have the stress concentrations that you have from ab abrupt right angles in, uh, that you, would, you can tolerate in steel. Uh, that's not to say you can't tolerate an aluminum, but you're going to have to take a hit on your safety factor or your allowable stress in order to do so. Any questions on that? Okay. So there are lots of design considerations. Most of which, if you think of a Navy ship made out of aluminum, they don't do, right? So, and now you wonder why you got cracking. So, uh, they uh, take a chance. I'd, put, I'd given you this slide before about different materials. I think I gave you this one. I think I handed it out to you even. Um, different materials, steels, aluminum, um, and different gases in welding. Aluminum does form porosity. It's not like hydrogen cracking in steels, and it's not delayed cracking in aluminum. Uh, you have a problem with both oxide films, with oxygen, uh, or inclusions, but with hydrogen, you end up with gas porosity. And it looks like it's the same, same physical principle in terms of solubility of the, the hydrogen in the metal, but it looks, it looks like lots of porosity. This is, I think this one may have even told you how much hydrogen was around. Um, the last one, the bottom one is 1% hydrogen in the shielding gas. This is a quarter percent hydrogen in the shielding gas. And here's argon gas with no hydrogen in theory. There's always a little moisture around. Uh, unless you take special precautions. But the problem is you have about a 50